yeah, thanks Eugene, that, that's really very interesting. Um, but I suppose you're talking about ideas and concepts, so I'm going to pull down, I might be more early. Uh. I was, I was reading, reading my paper on the train last night, and, and this morning when I was coming here, I realized what I'm going to talk about a lot is about sex. Right? So anyway, uh, I've uh, sort of uh, revised the, the title um, to sharpen it. Um, Singapore cartoons in the anti-yellow movement of the 50s and 60s. Um, now, in, in the 50s, there was an anti-comics movement in America, which was spearheaded by Frederick Wilhelm's Seduction of the Innocent, right? quite a famous book for any of you who have done uh, cultural studies, American studies. It was a, to me, it's a global cultural phenomenon in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you know, this anti-comics movement which led to the establishment in America of uh, Comics Code, all right? so for all those comic books that you read in the 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s, all right, whether it's DC or Marvel, there's always this little box at the side which is Comic Code Authority. All right? It is not by the government, it's a self-regulating body uh, among the publishers. All right? uh, it led, this Comics Code led to the end of EC Comics. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it, a great line of horror and, and war comics, uh, well acclaimed for its realism. Uh, it turned mad comic into a magazine as we know it. So, so basically there's no sex, no drugs, no death, no extreme violence, uh, no social issues. All right? So in the 70s, whenever DC or Marvel comics wanted to do issues about social problems, about drugs for example, in the famous um, Green Lantern, Green Arrow issue, uh, you know, drawn by New Adams, or the Spider-Man issues written by Stanley, those special issues were published without the comics code. So, so there were implications for that. And, and, and that, this also took place in the UK where you have uh, comics burning, and also in Asia, all right, in America, where, where comics by Tony Wong, all right, Wang Yilang were, were frowned upon, were banned, all right, and also there are uh, certain censorship in Malaysia and Singapore. So, so in that sense, comics were the, the bad boys of a uh, juvenile publication. All right. um, in Singapore, Singapore has its own uh, anti-comics movement as well. All right. in, in a way, to me, it offers an interesting case study as it was part of an anti-yellow culture campaign, first initiated by the anti-colonial groups in the 50s and later on by the PAB government when Singapore gained its <coughs> independence in the 60s. Now, there are, there are two questions which I'm interested in. Um, to raise, set to raise for this paper. So the first, as cartoonists were part of the intelligentsia and artists supporting the anti-yellow culture campaign, which I'll explain later, and as well as the anti-colonial movement, how did they critique yellow culture? Right, so, so in a sense, it's self-reflexive, right? I'm interested in, specifically sexual relationships in their cartoons. And secondly, all right, I mean, you have the rhetoric, all right, anti-yellow but I'm interested in the actual works, all right? So, so by examining the actual cartoons by the artists, uh, what, are, what were the social anxieties that accompany the new norms and changes in newly independent states in the period of decolonization in the 60s from the point of view of cartoons and illustration, all right? So um, first we'll, we'll take a look at Singapore's post-war uh, political situation, uh, the period of decolonization and anti-yellow culture movement. So that, that many other colonies, uh, you know, Singapore was caught up in the global wave of decolonization after the Second World War, and the post-war political situation brought about strange bedfellows, uh, including anti-colonists, anti-yellow culture campaigners. Now, the latter group were, were social reformers, all right, who felt that social vices from feudal China and the decadent West, all right, so it's not just anti-West, but it's also the East as well, right, feudal China, decadent West, were weakening the moral fiber of the people and impeding the preparation for independence and the creation of a new nation. Now, to use the definition provided by our former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew in 1998, he described yellow culture as the literal translation of the Mandarin phase, phrase for decadent and degenerate behavior. Wang Se, uh, Wen Hua. Right? And, and these social vices all right, uh, associated with yellow culture include pornography, prostitution, gambling, gangsterism and pop culture. So, Fang Wang Yun Tok, right, anti-yellow. It was a term that had historical significance in the early 20th century of a weakened China given to decadence and indulgence, and as a result, exploited by foreign powers. I mean, China was never, in a sense, a colony, right? But it was semi-colonized. So, so ensuing its status as a semi-colonized semi state before World War II, 
Uh, so therefore, yellow culture for China signified the unthinking adapt adoption, adaption, adoption of foreign cultural attitudes and leisure practices, which in turn led to the erosion of cultural resilience or ideological fortitude of a nation or civilization. So after the communist victory in China in 49, overseas Chinese groups like those in Singapore Malaya, like the students, like the intelligentsia, such as writers, artists, were inclined to have anti-yellow culture sympathies to read the societies of such perceived vices and to strengthen themselves. So that the Chinese phrase, Tuan Jie Si Li Liang. So the role played by the Communist Party of China since the 1920s in eradicating all these social ills was much admired and emulated by overseas Chinese in Singapore and Malaya. So in that sense, it was not surprising for the anti-yellow culture campaign of the 50s to be left-leaning and sympathetic to the communist cause. Yeah, I believe, I think I need to further elaborate on anti-yellow culture movement in Singapore because I don't think everyone is familiar with that. And uh, especially the difference between the first and second anti-yellow culture campaign. All right. So if you periodize it, the first, first campaign took place between 1953 and 1959. And the second campaign took place from 1959 onwards. And some would argue that you know, it continued to today. All right. I mean, we, we, we're still a very uptight society, like Singapore. All right. Uh, and culture serves politics, right? That, that's a fact. I mean, we have people here who, who work in museums, past and present, right? I'm sure you have your own stories and experiences. So with regards to the first anti-yellow culture campaign in the 50s, uh, a parallel can be drawn with the Mayfork movement of the 20s, when Chinese writers and students set about to create a new culture, new society, and even new writing in, in China. And the first stage of anti-yellow culture campaign was not a policy of the colonial government at the time, right? but a grassroots campaign um, led by contemporary Chinese intellectuals and students. Right? In Singapore, um, the year 1953 is often cited as the one with the most murders, right? we have murder city yeah? back in the 50s, since the end of the Second World War with violent crime wave even reported in the Australian newspapers, I dug it up. And, and one particular murder caught the public's attention. All right? On the afternoon of 12 October 53, a 15-year-old St. Anthony's Convent student, Chong Kit Tin, was raped and murdered at Pearl's Hill. Her case was never solved and the resulting moral panic and public outcry marked the beginning of the first stage of the anti-yellow culture campaign in Singapore, led by writers, students and social reformers. Uh, a main source of yellow culture in Singapore back then was the abundance of mosquito press in Singapore, all right, especially in the early 50s. This is the Xiao Bao. Now, this deployed newspaper selling sex and other sensationalized news uh, to increase its circulation. Of course, it's, it's driven by economics, uh, by, by monetary concerns, uh, arose as a result of the 1948 emergency regulations imposed by the British. Right? So, so um, economics, culture, and politics, they are linked. So, of course, 1948 was the start of the Malian campaign. All right? And what happened was many serious magazines were banned in 48 for the alleged uh, communist content and links, thus leaving a void in publications which was filled by more than over 40 mosquito newspapers. So it's not surprising that anti-yellow culture advocates also attracted anti-colonists to their cause as both parties agreed that the British government was to be blamed for the social ills plaguing the island and that colonial, new, colonial rule had to end in order to bring about a better society. Uh, as made clear in the documents collected in the anti-yellow culture campaign CO file, uh, which you can access at the National Archives of Singapore. This alliance between the anti-yellow culture advocates and the anti-colonists were followed closely by the one, the colonial government, and two, also by the Lim Hock administration, all right, um, from 56 onwards. On 18 August 1956, a major meeting was held at the Singapore Babylon Hall to set up the Anti-Yellow Culture Council, the AYCC, which was led by Lin Da Chen. Left-wing politicians such as PAP's Lim Chin Xiong and Lee Kuan Yew attended the meeting. However, the newly appointed uh, Lim Yew Hock government was ready to take firm action because it saw the anti-yellow culture campaign as a cover for the communists to destabilize society. And so this meeting was set up uh, on 18 August, exactly one month later on 8, 18 September. All right, Linda Chen was arrested, detained without trial and the two major organizations behind the AYCC, the Singapore Women's Federation, and the Chinese Brass Music Gong Society were deregistered and banned. Now, these arrests and deregistrations led to the Chinese middle school 
protest and the sit-in of October 1956, which actually is very famous. All right, uh, Chinese High, Zhongzhen High, all that. So actually, that that's a really famous event. The anti-yellow uh, movement is is sort of like a footnote, but I'm making the link that is you know is actually a continuity. All right. So the subsequent crash between the students and the police was a turning point in the anti-colonial history of Singapore as it gave the Lim government, the Lim Hock government, the chance for further detentions of Lim Chin Siong, Fong Sui Suan and Devon Nair in late October. So actually Linda Chen was arrested first in September, followed by Chin Siong, Fong Sui Suan and Devon Nair. So of course historians have of late have revisited the arrest of Lim Chin Siong to debate whether he was lawfully detained. Now at the heart of all this, which many people have forgotten, which is what I'm arguing, is that it's the anti-colonial culture campaign. So it could be said that the campaign was made use of by both sides, all right, for their political agendas, for, for the left as well as for the right, um, through the unfolding of events, all right. That the AYCC's formation in September, for instance, spurred the Lim Yu Hock government to, to take action against his advocates within a month, all right, very quickly. And when Linda Chen was arrested together with the outlawing of the, the women's, Singapore Women's Federation and the Chinese Brass Music Gone Society, uh, the anti the anti yellow culture campaign was in danger of losing its momentum. So this in turn prompted the quick mobilization of students for protests and demonstrations. All right, so it is a case of action reaction and uh, escalation of events. Now, one of the consequences of the anti yellow culture campaign was its proscription of the nascent literary scene in Singapore. In the nineteen fifties, the campaign had discouraged many writers from writing novels. Uh, stories with love related themes for fear that their works would be misinterpreted as sensationalistic. So, in light of the fact that even sentimental and romantic songs had their airtime on radio reduced by the PAP in 1959, so this, this fear is not unfounded. So, so actually, it's, it's a tension, right? For the social good, you need to suppress yourself. For the social good, maybe I need to censor you. Alright? So, what, 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 what's the difference between, you know, the social reformer and or right wing, blah blah blah, right? No, the left and the right have more commonalities. Of course, I, I think I think it's, it's, it's quite clear. So uh, just just to give you an example, uh, one of the writers was attacked for being a yellow culture writer during the fifties was Yao Zi, who's today uh, acknowledged as one of the pioneers of post-war Singapore Chinese literature. Now, now due to Yao Zi's personality and bad tempered, you know, being a writer and you know, he's really bad tempered. He made many enemies, all right, who attacked him during the anti-yellow culture campaign in the 50s. He also had written about the life worlds of the lower and working class uh, and, and described in his novels activities of gambling dance, race tracks. He treated his subject matters like extramental affairs, uh, gangsterism in a non-moralistic and non-judgmental manner which, you know, earned the wolf of the anti-yellow culture campaigners. All right, so it's seen in this context, his novels could actually be read as social realism rather than sensationalistic or exploitative. And what's interesting is he also did not take this lying down. He didn't take any shit from anyone. So in 1962, all right, uh, for his republication of his 1951 novel, Coffee Seduction, which was attacked as being anti, as being yellow cultured, um, he rewrote parts of it to respond to the accusation of him being a yellow culture author in the 50s. Um, after 56, after the whole arrest, uh, the anti yellow culture campaign uh, slowed down, right? uh, which is expected. Uh, the <coughs> Lim Yu Hock government um, banned anti colonial publications from 53 publishing houses in 1958, mainly from China and Hong Kong. And actually, I went through the list in the Singapore Gazette. So, even Shakespeare, Hans Christian Andersen, as long as you are published in China or Hong Kong, you are banned. So, that's, that's quite ridiculous. Huh? Right? It's just because it is translated into Chinese, but they're more concerned that anything that from China is, is banned. Right? Uh, and, and the, but, the, but the ironic thing is the mosquito press were not banned, and, but healthy publications from overseas were, were prescribed. So subsequently, uh, many including the new PAP government blamed the colonial government and Lim Hock administration for letting yellow culture run rampant from the mid to the late 50s. Okay, now uh, just a quick note. On, so, so that's the first movement, first campaign. Now a quick note on the second anti-yellow culture campaign, which is from 59 onwards. And I, I sort of subtitle uh, this section as uh, you know, moving towards modernity, an attempt to create uh, a Malayan consciousness. All right, no, no, okay, this next section is standard narrative, which I think some of you will be familiar with. 
um, Singapore went to the polls, of course, on 30 May 1959, right? Self-government, uh, sweeping the PAP into power within 10 days. The new government set out to distinguish itself from the previous administration by launching its own anti-yellow culture campaign. Right? So this is the interesting part. Huh? You all must wear white, holier than thou. On 9 June, the permits of eight newspapers were withdrawn immediately. All right, something which Lim Yew Hock didn't do, but Lee Kuan Yew did it. All right, in order to suppress examples of sex-obsessed culture. All right, and um, so other than newspapers, they also uh, banned the Mei Hua Plum Blossom stage show. All right, its license was withdrawn by the Ministry of Home Affairs for whatever reasons. I know. See, I'd like to see that show. Should be quite entertaining. Um, the PAP government laid the, the blame of the decadent society on colonial rule. All right? A government statement issued stated that under British rule, Singapore had been exploited economically, politically, and had been culturally devastated, thus echoing China's own yellow culture experience. Uh, the specific culprits in Singapore case were rock and roll, billiard bars, pin table, jukebox, salons, air-conditioned massage parlors, so it's not just massage parlors, but must be air-conditioned massage parlors <laughs> and of course strictly shows. Uh. Um, all this is quoted from newspaper, primary source. Uh, the, the PAP's anti-yellow culture campaign was a joint campaign between Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of Education and Ministry of Culture. So it's quite interesting, all right? It's three ministries coming together, so it's really a big deal. And it had a two-fold policy, all right? One, on one hand, it is to suppress examples of, again, uh, sex-obsessed culture and all activities tending to lower the standards of social morality and security and two, to create a social revolution for the future good of all. All right, so, so it's, it's this two-fold policy. Uh, the Home Affairs Minister, Ong Pang Boon, which later became the Education Minister, uh, had conferred with Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew and the Commission of Police on these matters. So the, the political agenda was explicit. The government statement stated our urgent task now is to correct the present degenerate standard of morals in our society, to create a new and healthy vigour in our society, and to foster a unified Malayan culture so as to establish the essential foundations for a rational society. All right, so again, the idea of a Malayan culture, Malayan identity, Malayan consciousness towards Malayan. Merger. The PAP's government's uh, aim of merger with Malaya it's clearly stated, right? Um, culture serves politics. So the anti-yellow culture campaign was not just to eradicate the old decadent culture, but it was also meant to create a new vibrant culture that was conducive for a merger with Malaya. The shaping of young minds and people's taste was high on the agenda. Um, I mean, as, as a researcher in Singapore, you know, we, we, we lack access. Uh, we have no, no access to certain files. So, so lacking access to mutual archives, about anti-yellow culture campaign. So the best I could do is, is uh, policy statements um, from a ra Singapore radio broadcast made by Ong Pang Boon in June 1959. So I'll be quoting quite a lot from that. Uh, it's significant that this culture policy was fronted by the Minister of Home Affairs rather than the Minister of Culture. Right, to me, this is an interesting point. Okay, Ong's uh, radio speech on this issue is highly uh, revealing. It's, it's widely reported in Straits Times and in Nanyang Sang Bao. Central Rebel and all those. Um, Ong wanted to portray the campaign as being rational, all right, uh, rather than emotional, and it's not, not puritanical, all right. So to quote it at length, he said, now let me make it clear that government is not being puritanical about this. It recognizes that sex is a legitimate theme for art, literature, and painting. Many great works of art and literature have been built around the theme of sex. The word keeps coming up. Huh? But there is a world of difference between using sex as a theme for literary and artistic purposes and exploiting it for commercial ends. In the former case, the aim is to bring about understanding of the relationship between the sexes. In the latter case, what is aimed at is literary lecturing. So it can be observed that in 1959, the new PAP government did not only perceive communism from China, the Cold War context, you know, as the enemy, but so also the moral values of celebrities from the West. And this is what Ong said. Huh? Uh, just as harmful are the magazines which glamorize the promiscu promiscuous life of celebrities, Hollywood, dwell at length on the barnyard morals of the less reputable of film stars and generally convey the impression that only interesting people worth writing about are call girls, pimps, gangsters, 
and men who make quick fortunes by obviously shady means. Ong likened the exposure to yellow culture as an intellectual and mental assault of the mind. He said, prolonged exposure to yellow literature has already left its mark on the more irresponsible sections of our youth. Certain types of films and music have contributed just as effectively to this raping of young minds. However, he also highlighted the positive aspect of this campaign and policy. Right? He said that actually that, that this new anti-yellow culture campaign of 59, all right, brought forth by the PAP, could offer new opportunities to new to local writers, artists, and publishers, as well as a radio audience. He said, writer, artists, and public-spirited publishers, cultural organizations, and government must fill the vacuum that will be that will be left as a result of suppressing yellow culture activities. And his final point in his Radio Singapore speech was, it would be one of the task of this government to give every encouragement it can to cultural activities, cultural activities which do not debase character and dull intellect, and which will not affect the government's efforts to bring about an early unification of Singapore and the Federation of Malaya. Now, the anti-yellow culture push continued throughout the 1959s to the 1960s. In August 1959, uh, the cinematograph uh, film's amendment bill was passed, allowing the Home Affairs Minister to impose film quotas and restrict the screening of certain specific classes of films from certain countries. So films with whose primary interest was the glorification or justification of colonialism, or which were made uh, or calculated to bring Asians and colored people into contempt, ridicule and hatred were to be banned. So it's not just Chinese communist films, but now they are making sure that you know only good Western films come through. All right. So these include Hollywood westerns where red Indians were massacred by the white man. So those those were no good, um, and even certain uh, Japanese undesir undesirable Japanese films. And to hasten the process of the censorship board, the board of film censors, the bill reconstitute the committee of appeal and reduce its membership from seventeen to nine. And the composition and appointments of the committee would, was to be made by the Home Affairs Minister. So again. Uh, the, the link between culture and politics, and it's, like I say, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it should be done by the culture the minister, a uh, culture minister, but it's done by the Home Affairs Ministers. Okay, now you must be wondering, uh, what, 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 where, where are the comics in all this, right? All right. So let's so let us move back to the fifties. Uh. so the attack on comics in Singapore started earlier in 1954 during the first anti-yellow culture campaign. Uh, in the Le Legislative Council, Representative Elizabeth Choi, some of you will be familiar, who was a war heroine during a Japanese occupation, spoke out against horror comics in November 1954 in, in Parliament. She said something must be done. It's our duty to protect children from the inevitable effects of such detrimental reading material. And when the PAP came to power in 59, comic books were seen as bad influence on the young, teaching them broken English and American values. In 1960, comic books came out attack when an informal group of 58 teachers from English language schools blamed the negative influence of bad comics for the rise of juvenile delinquency at a close, as a six hour closed door meeting. They proclaimed that comics were part of a misguided culture and that they gave local children a wrong conception of Malayan life. So again, the idea of Malayan identity. One teacher was quoted as saying, and this was reported in the press, the majority of the comics sold here have a Western message for our children. This is very dangerous for the emergence of Malayan mindedness. At a point in time, you know, as I've said, Singapore was moving towards a merger with Malaya and instilling a Malayan consciousness and culture was part of the social and political agenda of the day. And Western comic books were deemed as delinquent and unhealthy publications. By 1961, government had banned 34 American comic books, which 22 were part of the horror and strange tales genre. 12 World War II comic books depicting the US arms forces at battle were also banned. Superhero titles like Wonder Woman were not excluded and were also you know, prohibited. In 1969, more superhero comics like X-Men, Spider-Man, and Avengers were banned for being an unhealthy influence and containing themes of horror, suspense, violence, and fantasy. And it's not only American comic books that were targeted. Uh, Hong Kong action comics were also banned in Singapore in the early 70s. And it was reported that 19,000 Hong Kong comics were confiscated and destroyed in 1971. If those survive, you'll be very rich. Huh? You'll be collecting this item by now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so just to that that is uh, you know, quite quite a long context building, but I, I think I hope you appreciate that because now I'll, do, I'll go straight into well a brief history of political cartoon in Singapore and then um, 
the anti-yellow comics that I'm going to talk about. Okay, cartooning in Singapore could be traced back to the early 1990s when Chinese newspapers started using cartoons to comment on social and political issues. And one could say that cartooning in Singapore was political right from the start. Uh, with the publication of the first Chinese cartoon in Singapore in Zhongxin Repao in 1907. Right, this is an example from, from Zhongxin Repao uh, more than 100 years ago. And, and this newspaper was the organ of the Singapore Tong Ming Kui, Tong, uh, Singapore branch of the, the uh, Tong Ming Kui. Of course, some of you will know the Revolutionary Party of Sun Yat Sun, uh, the founding father of modern China, right, which brought about uh, the end of Qing Dynasty in 1911. Now, the earliest Chinese cartoons in Singapore were all anti Qing Dynasty cartoons, and this China focus would characterize most Chinese cartoons in the pre World War II period, as they were about social and political events in China. All right? It's only after World War II that more cartoonists drew about issues pertaining to Singapore agitating for social and political changes. So, so it, it, the timeline with, with political and social history uh, in Singapore you know, it parallels. All right. I mean, before World War II, the focus is really on what's happening in China, Marco Polo Bridge incident, uh, the warlocks, Yuan Si Kai, and all that. After uh, the Second World War, all right, like many of the artists, writers, right, uh, living in Singapore, even though they're overseas Chinese, they, they geared towards local issues. So again, anti-colonialism, uh, decolonization. Um, so, so seen in this light. Um, <coughs> The cartoonists were social reformers and anti-colonists who fought together with the students, workers, and trade unions for independence <coughs> from the British. All right, and this, this is a print by Tan Tiji. All right, uh, not not so much a cartoon, but it, it does show you know the coming together of students, workers, and artists. All right, uh, of course, fighting for a cause. I mean, it's, it's very symbolic: stone, flower, and all that. Um, so, so groups like Equator Society, which uh, uh, Ask Eugene more about that later. Uh, we're very active on this front. All right, various presidents of the Equal Art Society, like Lim Yu Guan, Ko Sa Yong, have talked about the anti-colonial and socialist, socialist, socialist leanings and the support uh, society gave to anti-colonial, anti-yellow campaigns. All right, so again, a confluence of, of factors coming together. Um, these artists could be categorized as organic electrodes, uh, as defined by Gramsci. Uh, writers and artists who were on the side of the dispossess, the downtrodden society, rather than standing with the establishment. They did not see themselves as part of the yellow comic books that were being attacked. Their cartoons appeared in newspapers and magazines that pushed for self-determination and independence. So, uh, I, I know it's rather small, um, but you could see, for example, this is a student, all right? Uh, it's a student that's wearing shorts. Huh? <laughs> right, so he's holding a book, a pen, and then there are small students, and you know these are vices, uh, all right. So this is anti-yellow. Um, okay, again, you can't really see it. Uh, I wish I had better reproductions, but but basically these are again vices, uh, right? The the, the, the businessman, the salesman, uh, peddling vice or, or yellow culture to the masses, right? And actually, this this is like arrow attacking it, all right, destroying it. And these are done in 1955, uh, 1956. Uh, and, and basically, the fountain pen, all right, is, is seen as, as a weapon against vices and ignorance, all right, knowledge. Um, okay, this is another example of anti yellow publications from 53 from uh, Huang Di. So again, book burning, all right which is a similar scene in, in, for comic books in, in the 50s in America, in, in the UK. But then again, how different is this from what's happening in Germany in the 40s or 30s? However, you know, um, when it comes to sexuality and morality, uh, what were drawn in actual cartoons could be quite different from the anti-hero culture stance of the cartoonists. All right? so, so to me, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in, in that. I think things are not so simple, all right? I, and I think we, we should not be just reading uh, secondary sources or, or what people tell you. Sometimes you, you talk to some of these groups, they tell you, oh, I've done this, I've done that. But what, what does it actually mean? I think you need to look at artwork. But I, I think when, when you look at the artwork and you compare with their statements, I, I think it reflects and it, it shows us glimpses of the contradictions and tensions 
right, in, in dealing with modernity during decolonization and the early post-colonial period. So to me, there's a rhetoric and then there's a reality. And art does not mirror life all the time and vice versa. Okay, so, so basically I, I'm going to throw a spanner in all this, right? Um, sexuality, morality and modernity. Is it truly anti-yellow? Um, I think we have some guests here. I mean, some of you have just arrived in Singapore uh, today uh, for, for this symposium. Now, outsiders' view of modern-day Singapore is, of course, a clean and, and green city, right? However, we must never forget that Singapore is a port city and remains a port city, all right, geographically. And the port city means you have all the vices and temptations offered and demanded by a port city, right? Uh, crime was rampant in the immediate post-war years and the pre-war society's ordinance was enacted to curb the problem of social societies was reinstated in the late 40s after it was expanded due to the war. Dance halls were the places of Chinese businessmen frequent. They frequent there to conclude business deals and other businesses. Um, cabaret culture took root in the, in the 30s when three popular amusement worlds, the New World, the Great World, the Happy World, opened cabarets for dancing, merrymaking and, ex and other extramarital activities after that. Um, in the Chinatown area, Bukit Basso was known as the Mistress Street, where many rich men mistresses were housed. Uh, Yi Ho Hien, the Million S Club, is prominent located along this street. So societal attitudes towards sex in the 50s Singapore, to me, is conflicting at best, right? Um, now, contrary to the stereotype of the colonizer as a zealous social reformer, the British authorities were actually more liberal than some segments of the local communities in the 50s. Now, according to Atlantic Charter, uh, the British was, were to prepare its colonies for eventual independence. And part of the preparation for decolonization was to provide a more free and liberal social environment. And I'll argue including sexual norms and morals. However, for the Chinese community, this was seen as another Western attempt to weaken its people. With the rise of modern China unified by Mao Zedong's communist victory against Kuomintang in 49, it marked a change in the Chinese community in Singapore. It gives them a sense of pride, right? The, you know, so, so therefore, the Chinese community in Singapore was inspired by the self-determination shown by Mao in resisting American overtures in the mainland. It was also exposed to the wave of anti-colonialism that was sweeping across Asia and Africa. However, to embrace anti-colonialism and its modernist ideals was also to reject some of the old feudal ways of the past. So for one to be modern, does that mean one needs to be you know, basically just a uh, one man, one woman sort of relationship and to give up other worldly vices, all right? We are talking about the Chinese community, yeah? all right, and, 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 and practice. So such social and cultural anxieties, right, can be seen in the cartoons of the 50s and 60s. So the examples I'm taking um, are, taking, are, are taken from the, the main English and Chinese newspapers of the early 50s from the Straits Times and Nanyang Sang Pao. And to illustrate this, uh, you know, okay, this, this seems like a quite straightforward anti-yellow cartoon, right? Lu uh, Ban Gong, this is how he works, uh, right? This this guy in office, he should be working by looking at naked pictures, and so productivity has gone down, while well, something else is going up, you know. <laughs> so anti-yellow, um, but you know, but yeah, anyway. Okay, um, okay, this, this one is Sing Sing Xiang Yin, so I, I, I use it to translate it as similar desires. Uh, it's seemingly straightforward depiction of transaction involved between sex and money. So the man is thinking about sex while a woman is thinking about the money she can make or get by being with the man. Now, the pro I mean, again, you know, this, this appeared in popular, basically in, in mainstream newspapers. It's like reading this in Cao Pao or Straits Times every day, they flip it, and it's there. Right, and can be read by children and, and whoever. Now the problem with such a simplistic portrayal of the social situation was that readers could mistake the cartoon as merely reflecting the latest relationship trend in society. Right? We, we can't control how people read certain things. That's, that's reading. <coughs> that's to say it's acceptable for both men and women to be flirtatious and it's modern to have different partners. Right? And the readers might view it as an endorsement of such social behaviour. So th there's no way I can confirm this, right? There's no way to confirm the intentions of these works. So there is a danger that the depiction of the naked female body, all right, 
in these so-called moralistic cartoons was an excuse to exploit it further, right? And if you okay, now it's, it's quite common, right? Now, now the the female naked body you can see in exhibitions, right? But in the fifties, you know, definitely no photos of such shot, but it appeared in cartoons, right? So so you have to move your mind a bit, and maybe that's how they're getting away with it by drawing naked bodies. So this is the other one, uh, Evolution. This is quite a clever cartoon. I like this a lot. They appear in a straight sense in 1951 by, by Tan Hui Ping. Uh, again, it shows similar depictions and possible exploitation of female form to satisfy the male gaze and readership. Right? The cartoon could be a critique, could be a critique of society giving more freedom to females. So it shows the evolution, the evolution, it's quite a good pun, of women from being a wife, so wearing traditional, Chinese clothes do more modern dressing of tight fitting chong sam, all right, uh, and Western dresses, right, including smoking a cigarette. To her, um, in a bikini, participating in in beauty contest, and these women are parading on a giant stage, right? Shape, shape as a question mark, and, and the scantily clad uh, bikini lady stands at the door of the question mark, all right. So the design is actually important. Uh. This is, I think this one is, is crafted, all right? Obviously, it's not by, mis by error or mistake. So the, uh, the artist seems to be asking what is the world coming to when we allow women folk so much freedom to dress as such. So it's, of course, rather patriarchal. However, it's also obvious to the reader how well-drawn and endowed the cartoonist has made the women out to be. Uh. Ping is famous for his very shapely cartoons, right? I think in Malaysia as well, all these were reprinted in Malaysia. It's quite famous also. So this, is, to me, is a limitation of single panel cartoons that by reflecting social reality to comment on it, the work might actually reaffirm that reality. So this possibility is also supported by the kind of logo cartoons that accompany regular columns in the leisure page of the newspaper. So it's not just in the cartoons, but also in those small logos which appear uh, every day, all right? So which means it's, it's sort of, uh, this is a column, a daily column, and this logo appeared all the time. Okay, again, I uh, apologize for the, the bad reproduction, but this is Tan Kou Chi, which, uh, well, again, I trust it as take a break. Nah. All right, so, so it's, it's about leisure and you know, social, social articles. Um, so, so this image is used in the early 1950s Nanyang Sang Pao leisure column. And it shows a man you know, having a drink with a sexy looking woman, and, and both of them are dressed in Western clothes. Right, and it's it's modern, right? Uh, I can't, can't see very clearly, but this is obviously like you know, wine glasses or champagne glasses. Um, and this is the other one that I will show you, uh, which is used for the heading of the leisure page itself. And Sang Yu, okay, Lucy translated other business. Um, and it, it, it reaffirms the paternalistic patterns of society. All right, it shows a man kicking back at home, slacker sitting on the sofa smoking his pipe and the background housewife or the wife or whoever is drawing the blinds to make it more comfortable for the husband right um, now in both cases these images of supposed modernity as indicated in their western dressing and attitudes uh, contradicted, contradicted the new values of a post-war society right so that's why I'm giving you the context of anti-yellow anti-colonial but these images are in the newspapers and to me, the un unintentional message of these two logo cartoons reveal more about societal attitudes and anxieties as they appear almost daily in the columns. While other cartoons reflected social happenings, these two cartoons could be shaping social norms uh, about men-women relationships as they are a constant feature uh, in the newspapers. So the question seems to be, how does one become a modern man when he still wants to be a man's man? Right, so issues of masculinity are, are at stake. Um, after Singapore gained self-government in 1959, prostitution was made legal in order not to drive it underground. Such anxieties about sex and society were further combated in 53. Right, I've mentioned uh, how Chong Gok Gok Ting was was raped and murdered uh, in 1950s and never solved, and which led to the anti-yellow culture movement of the mid 50s, which brought left-wing organizations, students, and cultural groups together to fight against societal ills and vices. And many of these cartoons were published in student magazines to attack yellow culture. So very quickly, because I'm running out of time, 
uh, this is an anti yellow. This 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 cartoon is actually titled Fan Wang Yun Dong, right? Fan Dui Se Qing Wen Hua from 1955, and it's particularly striking as it shows the anti yellow culture campaigners in action. All right, uh, very explicit. No two ways about it, right? You know what what's the intent. But when you read about when you read against it, all right, basically these guys, all right, with some female students and carrying this giant pen, right? This giant pen is an instrument of education and culture, attacking the yellow elements on the left, including a naked woman. Right. So looking at this image carefully, uh, I mean it's kind of disturbing uh, as one cannot help but notice how phallic the giant pen is. Right. It's huge, yeah. Uh. So so is this cartoon promoting violence against women just because they are yellow? Right? So these are questions that run through the mind. And, and such tensions occur in cartoons throughout the 50s and 60s. No, throughout the 70s, 60s and 70s. With the passing of the Women's Charter in 61, polygamy was finally outlawed. Uh, however, reactions from the public as reflected in the cartoons was ambiguous as best. Huh? So this is one from 1960. Uh, reactions to the policy on monogamy. Um, from Sinzhou Rebao, and it shows two panels, all right? It doesn't matter which one you read first. Um, the poor family, all right, on the right, with two young children, seems to be in agreement with the policy, <coughs> while the rich and modern family shows a mixed reaction, right? The mother and daughter look happy, all right, uh, with the news <coughs> of the policy, but the father and son have a look on their face that suggests they were perturbed, all right? So have they been fooling around outside? I don't know. And, and so therefore the class and <coughs> social implications of this cartoon seem to imply that the poor had no money or time to fool around and those who could afford to support a second or third wife were hard hit by the policy. So anxieties about sexuality and mor or morality continued into the 70s. <coughs> as Singapore progressed, you know, as a new nation filled with modern development of its economy and industries, traditional values were seen as the backbone of society and to provide that cultural balance against Western decadence, especially hippie culture. Right, so so you have cartoons like this, right? For you know, if you if you're rich enough to, to send your your kids overseas, they come back not just a child but also a guitar, all right? So rock and roll, eh? um, So so, right? So obviously this is a critic against Western culture, hippie culture. Um, so the important family unit was deemed to be disrupted by the misguided notions of women, Western women's lit. Women rights were one of the election platforms for the PP in 59. Emancipation was promised with the Women's Charter. But however, the 1970s Women's Liberation Movement in the West was seen to have a dangerous effect of influencing wives and mothers to abandon their families to have a good time um, with young starts while the going is good or when the mature ladies still have the goods. So, so you read from, yeah, from right to left. Right? Now, a study of the imagery in these cartoons from Sinjo Roba, another major Chinese newspaper of the time, makes one wonder if there's a subversion of values going on in these cartoons. See, in order to attack such, such sexual behavior, images of these luscious ladies were being reproduced in the cartoons. So this affirmed the male, male gaze for such imagery and might even promote the acceptance of such social norms. The fact that these cartoons were male suggests an un ironic return to the popularity of erotism via anti-yellow cartoons. Right? Uh, okay, this, this cartoon is from Sin Chou 1972. It shows a, a black comic scene of a father meeting his teenage daughter at a bar. Right? Uh, so, so the cartoon is supposedly you know, decrying sexual promiscuity and the, the taboo nature of a probable father and daughter coupling was highly erotic in a very deviant way. Like. I'll argue. So, so it sort of like, you know, serve both, both ends. And to me, all right, I said this could be due to the limitations of the cartoon format in not being able to present a more complex argument, especially dealing with issues of sexuality. It, these are just uh, preliminary thoughts and, and more research is needed. For example, you know, to identify the cartoonists. All right? I mean, I know some of them, they were able, but the earlier ones, it's very hard to find who, who they are. So by way of conclusion, while one cannot establish that all the cartoons under discussion were drawn by cartoonists who were part of the anti-yellow culture movement, the fact that they were produced during the same milieu reflects the social anxieties and tension that exists between the social norms that were taking place and the popular cartoons themselves, right, which reveal a more patriarchal outlook 
they were being created. Um, it's, it's useful to consider what Pata Chatterjee has said about uh, the contradicting nature of nationalism or anti-colonialism, that it reflects the expression of Westernism in colonialism, but it also retains a basic belief in post-enlightenment rationality, which marginalized indigenous ways to determine the shape of the nation. So to me, that explains in some ways the social anxieties and tensions found in the cartoons when cartoonists and other cultural workers were supposed to be anti-colonial, anti-yellow, but the works produced in this case, the cartoons, were not always aligned to the core of social reforms. Right? So, so by examining the details of the anti-yellow culture campaign and by looking closely at the actual cartoons produced, they reveal the contradictions faced by newly independent states in the area of culture and its popular expressions. Okay, thank you.